All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, Rob Sidor and uh, Jeremy Davis here again. And uh, this morning, uh, we've been fortunate enough to get folks to uh, join us about Podman Desktop and uh, simplifying doing container uh, development. And uh, how would we use that to move to Kubernetes? Uh, Jeremy, are you still with us? Hold on. I think I am. Yeah, I'm sorry, there I'm you are. Um, I am streaming from the Red Hat office, so this is not my home internet. Uh, but uh, yeah, sorry that froze. So yeah, this is very cool stuff. I love Docker. I have loved Docker for a long time, and Docker Desktop. And so Podman was a really uh, welcome and interesting. So I'm really looking forward to what you guys are going to share today. So why don't we uh, introduce everyone, uh, Maureen? You want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, sure. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a long-term Red Hatter. My name is Maureen Duffy. I'm a UX designer, and um, I actually work um, on the Podman Desktop UI. Um, do you want to go next, Tim? Yeah, sure. I just went full screen to the button moved to unmute. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Tim DeBoer. I'm a, a developer experience architect, um, and uh, yeah, I uh, work with a number of teams, but uh, primarily Podman Desktop. I'm just trying to improve the, the user experience and the, the technical uh, direction. Jeff? Uh, so I'm um, I'm working for Red Hat for several years now. I use for the I'm working for the developer tools uh, business unit, and I'm the engineering manager for the, the Podman Desktop team. So working for a few months now on Podman Desktop. Oh, that's great. Uh, that also means we can't say anything bad about management like we usually do here, right, Jeremy? So we'll be careful this morning. <laughs> so Maureen, tell us why Podman Desktop and, and how did we get there? Because um, I'm a big proponent and user, but um, I also come from, like Jeremy, a developer background where I was using uh, you know, Docker Desktop. Uh, and I'm on a Mac, so I think Jeremy is too. Um, tell us, you know, how did we get here and, and what can we get out of this? Sure. So um, I can say, because I, I actually report in the um, the Red Hat's uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux broad team. And that's the team that the Podman desktop team is under, or the Podman team is under. So um, for a, a long time, actually, uh, we had users of Podman who, who liked the Podman approach to containerization. Um, there's a few things that are different about how Podman works. It is not daemon based. Um, it, it's based on system D. So like it'll launch when needed, but it's not always running in the background, you know, eating up RAM and whatnot. Um, it also, it, it tends to be um, security first focused. So it's compatible with SD Linux and security technologies. Um, and so we, we have a pretty good user base, but they were coming from, you know, the old school Linux background, not necessarily Mac and Windows users. And just as a UX practitioner, I can say that um, because Mac OS and Windows, for the most part, are very visual um, operating systems, people don't tend to go in the command line, unless you're a developer, of course, but they don't tend to use the command line so much. They're used to doing things on UIs, and Podman didn't have a UI. And... Um, there were a bunch of requests, and I, I think probably Tim or Jeff would even be more familiar with sort of the uh, the origin of the Podman Desktop project. But I remember when before Podman Desktop started, um, the the Podman team had asked me to like mock up some kind of little UI so at least people could get a visual of what containers were running on their system without having to go to the terminal. So um, the project just sort of organically grew from wanting to have a graphical. Um, interface for Podman itself. And then the other thing is the premise of Podman, it's named Podman because the construct is pods, which is the same as in Kubernetes. So we really wanted to be um, sort of like on the path of going to Kubernetes and be focused on pods, um, using kubeyaml to deploy pods. Um, so that's sort of maybe a difference. I don't know if it's like right now, but certainly a difference in early philosophy of where the direction we were trying to take the project. Um, I don't know, Tim or Jeff, if you have another perspective, but that's my view. Yeah, sure. Um, so we started talking about this already, uh, I think more than two years ago now. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a few of the discussions at that point, you know, everyone was starting to use containers on the desktop, you know, containers had, had taken over. 
but people were running uh, containers in uh, Docker, uh, maybe doing Compose because they were starting to get more than one container on uh, you know whatever project they were working on. Um, and then they were going into production on OpenShift or you know another Kubernetes environment with a completely different setup. So you had this disconnect, you know, not just the it works on my machine, but uh, you know, fundamental concepts between uh, you know Compose and Kubernetes. There's there's some differences there, um, and Podman uh, around that time was starting to be a real option on Windows and Mac. Uh, we wanted to you know not just you know hey it also works on Windows and Mac, but we wanted a UI for it to make it more accessible to a wider audience. We want to make the install flows easier. Um, and then, as uh, as Mo said, the transition from you know individual containers or maybe uh, compose to pods to Kubernetes, you know that's not a uh, they aren't like completely uh, fundamentally different things. It's a, an evolution. There are some uh, you know uh, benefits, some differences, but we want to make it easy to go from you know individual containers to pods to Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, we we started down this path, and then of course uh, also with uh, Docker starting to change uh, the way that they distribute. You know that was another uh, uh, you know kind of added benefit. Uh, people are looking for other options, um, and Podman is uh, an excellent uh, option. Well, I for one, um, I have a I've had the opportunity to work with a couple of customers that. Uh, they told me, you know, a while ago that one of the reasons they hadn't adopted Podman yet, even though it was on RHEL, was because um, they were using Docker and Docker Desktop was part of their development experience. And um, when Podman Desktop came out, it actually was instrumental in helping them move because they really wanted Podman and the security and all the features of Podman um, and wanted to replace um, Docker on their RHEL um, because of those. Um, but they felt that the handicap of not having that on the desktop as part of their developer experience was holding them back. And now they're all bought in on it. So, um, you know, have you had, you know, from a customer feedback perspective, you're Tim, you're, you're talking about user experience, you know, what, what were some of the challenges that you saw when you wanted to move, you know, people over because Podman isn't exactly the same as as Docker, but it adds a lot of key advantages there, especially around security and other other features. Yeah, so there's so many uh, ways I could uh, take that. Um, I guess first, we're not trying to be like a, uh, a Docker replacement, although Podman has uh, you know tried very hard to make sure that the same commands work, that things are compatible, um, you know, that you get the same uh, experience. If you're, you know, just doing images, containers uh, on your desktop, um, for me, it's much more about the, you know, the movement between environments. Uh, do you have, uh, you know, Docker or Podman on your local machine? You have Kind, Minikube, um, going remotely, another Kubernetes flavor, or OpenShift. Uh, being able to kind of seamlessly go, you know, between those environments, or take what's working in Compose locally, or Pods locally, you know, change it, um, uh, and move that to Kubernetes. Uh, so for me, it's much more about the the flow and having um, uh, fidelity uh, between those. I think I, I would also add something, if, if that's OK. Um, I, I have to say this, um, being a very uh, pro open source upstream contributor to many upstream projects, um, one of the, the things about Podman Desktop is it is an open source project. Um, the, the actual user interface is open source. And um, we take a very open approach to what we allow, say, extensions to do within the interface. Um, other software might not be as open about, for example, like adding uh, an action to the actions menu of containers. It, it doesn't allow sort of the deep integration that we allow. Um, being an open source project gives us the ability to have discussions with other other contributors. We, we have some strong contributions from folks outside of our team at Red Hat who are contributing. Um, you know, for example, the Minikube and um, I think the Lima 
extension, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know the mini cube extension is, is being developed by a community contributor. And um, just generally at Red Hat, we feel that doing things in the open upstream and an open source community is the right way to build software. Um, and that's kind of an important thing about Podman Desktop. Yeah, I think that is a, a fundamental and important difference. I mean, Podman is uh, our namesake. Uh, it is open. Um, but this was never about just doing local containers. It was always, uh, you know, moving between the uh, environments, supporting Kubernetes, different flavors. And, you know, we have seen several contributions uh, from, from, you know, other contributors, non-Red Hat contributors on those. So we've got a couple of... Uh... We have a couple of questions from people, and I know, like, and you guys want to do a demo as well. Um, would you guys want to uh, jump into the, maybe we'll let's hold the questions kind of till the end? So I'll get a plan. You guys want to do a demo here? Uh, yeah, sure. I can, uh, jump in. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm totally set up and I haven't uh, shared on this platform. Before. Throwing you on a. Yeah. Nothing like, uh, you know, putting you on the spot, right? So. Um... Yeah, so some of the questions we had, we'll, we'll, we'll take questions then. So, um, so uh, Vishwanath mentioned that he couldn't get his containers running in the background. So he, so he said he likes the philosophy of Podman being daemonless, but he wanted to run containers in the background. Uh, to be honest, I don't see why it won't be possible. I think it's it's completely, completely disconnecting from the fact that uh, Podman is not a daemon. Uh, so it should be possible that you you run a, you run a container as a daemon and it will uh, it will run in the background. So I don't see why it's not uh, possible. Okay, uh, I would like to know. Yeah. Also, join. Where what community? Where, where's the community? Where's the, where's the forum? The, the link to the forum or anything? If you guys want to get involved and ask questions, how do you you guys usually interact with the community? Yeah, I think if people just go to Podman Desktop, podman-desktop.io, uh, we've got all the links from there. Um, we're on Discord. There's GitHub discussions, issues. Or there's a link. All right. Yeah, yeah I'll dump the link in there. Cool. All right, we want to run through your demo right now, and then we'll, we'll come back to questions after, after we take a look at some stuff. Yeah. Desktop in action. So I thought I would just walk through uh, the UI, try and show some of the features, and then do a quick uh, you know, running a pod and deploying it to uh, to the developer sandbox. Um, so this is Podman Desktop. Um, you know, all of the standard uh, things for images and containers are here. You can go see a list of your images, the volumes. Uh, pods and containers. You can click on anything to get to the details, you know, and then depending on what you're clicking on, uh, you get different tabs, uh, summary of each, logs. Um, we've tried to make the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, YAML uh, very accessible. Um, so you can uh, click on any object, see the Kube YAML, copy and paste that uh, if you want to. Um, in the settings, um, I'll just drop to uh, extensions for a minute. Um, so I've installed, there's uh, several extensions that come pre-installed, obviously Podman, uh, Docker support. Um, we have support for Lima, Minikube, uh, uh, OpenShift Local, and uh, Red Hat Developer Sandbox. Um, and you can install those uh, very easy. Um, Tim, I'm not trying to uh, rain on your parade, uh, but the can you increase the size of your screen maybe a little bit? The, which the size of the window or uh, the text? Oh, sorry. Is that good enough? I'm just replying to the uh, folks that are online. That's all. Um, they said it was a little blurry. Maybe just a little bigger. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I've got a 4K monitor and a 1080p. I went with the 1080p because it looks big to me. Oh, and you're getting 720p through the. Okay, that's okay. Um, 
So on the in the settings on the resources page um, is where you can uh, you know create uh, new Podman machines or uh, other environments. Um, so Podman uh, this is another difference from Docker. You can create multiple machines. Um, only start one of them at a time, but it gives you a way to have like different projects and shut down all of those containers, uh, start a new machine. Um, so I have four of them, and I'm running uh, this one uh, now. Um, and as you saw, you know these are the images in that container. Sorry, in that Podman machine, these are the the containers, and and it's showing what's running. Um, so I actually left this part around. I'm just going to delete it. Um, and I loaded way too many containers. Now I forget what was in there. Uh, So I can see Podman's uh, stuff in there, but if I'm running Docker also, I can see Docker uh, containers that are in there also? Yep. Now, what if I'm uh, running, I mean, a lot of developers, including myself, have used Docker Compose. Can I see stuff that's in there for that? Yeah, so I actually have a Compose container uh, or Compose running at the, at the bottom here. OK. That's a compose group. Um, I've uh, I did uh, Podman compose up from the command line half an hour ago, and then I stopped it from here. But you can start and stop it um, once you've created it. Cool. And do you prefer like for your uh, preferred workflow? Do you like doing uh, compose and then you pushing everything to Kube later, or, or, or do you like running Kube locally, like using Minikube or something? Um, for me, I uh, run Kube uh, locally or deploy to developer sandbox. Um, I just, you know, I, I know there are millions of Compose projects out there. You need to have that. It's table stakes. Yeah. Uh, people, and if people are doing just standalone containers or Compose, that's fine. You know, we uh, definitely support that workflow. Um, so another thing I do, Tim, is um, I always have a, uh, I'm running RHEL on a, or Fedora on a Parallels instance on my Mac because I push everything over there when I'm done working on it locally. Um, I, can, I can view all that remote stuff too, right? No? I see Jeff shaking his head. No, no. Uh, so today we are we are supporting only uh, Podman machines that are running locally on your ah, workstation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's on on the roadmap. If you'd like to connect to remote ones, then we'd love to learn more about your use case. Awesome. I'll I'll throw some zingers in there later, Maureen. <laughs> Just as a developer, I uh, um, I, I tend to uh, do my local um, development with the desktop environment, but if I'm generating, you know, uh, say Kubernetes stuff, I don't like. Even though I used to run Minikube all the time locally, I now run something remotely, and I want to push it over there, um, kind of experience just to see. And because I do uh, edge development, I want to push stuff to Podman remotely. Um, and my first test is, can I do it with just a VM on my machine? Yeah, and I actually, that's a use case I would love to support at some point too. Cool. Um, make it to connect to the remote environment and, uh, and yeah, push containers. Cool. Sorry, we were, we were interrupting you. You were going forward, so. Yeah. Sorry, and I got uh, flustered, and I couldn't remember where my no, containers. If, if you leave were. any, if you leave any empty space here, we'll fill it with an in chatter. So um, just. Uh... Yeah, that's fine. And I, uh, I found them. I have these two uh, containers here. I'm actually gonna pop them both. Um, there's two containers uh, to turn it into a pod. It's really easy. You just click on the Podify button. Um, we can give it a name. Uh, I don't know, my pod nine, just to show I'm changing the name and click create pod. And you'll see 
it appears here, and it's running. So this pod has those two containers in it. Uh, and you can see it's running on 8088. And somewhere back here, it left a web browser. And there's my, I should have done the, the thing and open the web browser and prove it wasn't there first. But this is the pod we just created. It's running. And I refresh it. And I get the, uh, uh, the counter increasing. Um, I, I also have uh, an OpenShift instance. This is uh, Red Hat Developer Sandbox. Um, I created an instance uh, an hour ago and uh, just went through to connect Podman Desktop to it. Um, but we can go back to our pods view. Find that pod again. Uh, and I guess, sorry, I should show there is nothing running here, right? I'm looking at the topology view. There's nothing on the sandbox. I'm going to go back to Podman Desktop. Just say deploy to kube. Uh, we'll leave it as my pod 9. Um, and it's going to connect to my sandbox. So we just leave that for a minute. It's deploying that pod, and uh, it's already running. Uh, and of course, it opened in another another monitor. So you generated the code for uh, deploying it to Kubernetes and pushed it there. Yeah, so I mean, just creating the pod out of it has. Uh, sorry, I can go back uh, to show that too. Um, just by creating the pod. Right, I've effectively just deployed this YAML to Podman. And then when I'm going to uh, the developer sandbox, it's just pushing that YAML over, standing up the same pod there. Okay. Um, so you can see uh, it's been deployed. Um, and uh, actually, sorry, that's localhost. Let's open up the one that's running. What? Demo gods. Of course. Uh, and I want to go back to the link here, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, did we add a link here to it? I'm pretty sure I could check the box to create an ingress. Um, yeah, sorry. I, uh, I'm i not very good at talking and demoing at the same time. <laughs> OK. We, we so, did have a couple of questions on. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Oh, I was just going to say, I do have a little demo, too. Um, I'm not familiar with this platform, and I use Linux. So it, it I might not get to do screen share. But if it works, I can show one of the new features that came out in Podman 1.5, which Tim is also um, running, that just came out last week. It's um, an onboarding flow for setting up Compose, if if folks wanted to see that. I think that would be great. That'd be very cool. That'd be awesome. I have a All lot right. of old projects. <laughs> yeah, Let's we, see if I can. We do, we, uh, yeah, we do a lot of stuff with Compose, so that, that would be great. And while, while you're doing that, uh, Maureen, um, there's a couple questions uh, about, you know, where can we go to get this? I know on a Mac, uh, so I have a Fedora machine behind me, which is, you know, kind of brainless. I just do a DNF install and I get everything. But um, on a Mac, I just use Brew and I'm not familiar with Windows. So um, is is it like in Chocolatey or is there, where would I go to get um, the install for both Podman and Podman Desktop for Windows? Uh, so yeah, we. I mean, maybe Mo, you can just open up the website, uh, and we can look at the options. Uh, let me see if I can get into a window. Okay. My system is not happy right now, sorry. Okay, so um, okay. if we go to downloads. 
and there were some questions about um, tutorials and things of that nature. I did paste a uh, link to the Podman, uh, Dan's Podman book in there. Um, maybe I'll paste it again later. Um, but, you know, other kind of basic tutorials like setting it up and stuff. I know, again, setting it up on the Mac is, and, and Linux is a kind of uh, brainless, but because um, it's so easy, but I, I just don't know anything about Windows. Oh, chocolatey Winget. Is that the is that the native one? The Winget thing? Yes. Never heard of Scoop. Okay. So wherever your uh, desktop applications are sold, you can obtain Podman desktop for Windows. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Maybe you can go look at the Mac and Linux too, but we've tried to basically be in all the normal package manager gotcha. uh, options for each platform. In Linux, we do um, flat pack and we also have a tar. Cool. And Mac is brew and something else. I think it's just brew and I didn't catch the last thing you said. Sorry, uh, disk image, image. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah. I only use Brew because it just gives me the automatic updates. Cool. Yeah, the first thing. So when I first downloaded <laughs> Podman, Desktop, my like my first impression was like this is a really nice UI. Like this, this looks really really nice. Which being a Red Hat employee, I think I can kind of poke fun at Red Hat's UI over the years. <laughs> a lot of our UIs aren't necessarily the best. I was like really yeah. pleasantly surprised. Like I was like, wow, this is really easy to use and really nice and laid out. It's great. Well, that's what happens when you have you a UX have person. Yeah. <laughs> so and I hope you guys can hear me okay too, because I know like the network is not doing great right now uh, on, my, on my system. But um, just holler if I break up. But I just wanted to demo real quick this new onboarding feature we have for Compose. Um, we also have a new onboarding feature for Podman, but I'm running Linux and Podman's part of the system, like the bare metal OS. So it doesn't work on Linux because you already have it. But um, I'm going to click here to set up Compose. It's looking to see if I have the Compose client installed, and I don't. And and uh, just just as you know, to level set. This lets you download the Compose client and set it up. It doesn't like we don't have a UI way of running Composes yet. So basically, it will set the client up for you. And when you go to the command line and you run your Compose command, then your Composes will show up in Podman Desktop. Um, but I just go through here. It's not binary. I could have picked another version, by the way. You're breaking up a bit for me, Mo. Also. Your audio is a little choppy, but I get your screen resolution is really good. So, how, ma how many syllables? <laughs> Could you at least see the screen? Uh, we can hear you fine now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you see the screen? I was just going yeah. through it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, visual looks great. Um, there was a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, Podman Compose works with Docker Compose files. Uh, you know, once you've gone through and installed this, um, you can just do Podman Compose up. You know, just as you would. Here, let me see if I can do that real quick. Oh, thank God. Somebody who uses ZSH besides myself. Okay. <laughs> I haven't actually tried this, by the way, before, so I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah, so that's exactly what I did this morning to get the compose file to show up on my list. And then, you know, I could start and stop from within Podman Desktop. 
Oh, no. Okay, sorry, bad demo. <laughs> Never mind. Should have worked. My machine is not happy right now, so um, it could be related. I'm not sure. I'll go debug it. I'm going to turn off screen share and try to figure out what's going on. But the idea is that I can uh, do a drop in for a compose file. Is that the. Yes, and it normally works. Outcome, right? It normally okay. works. I have a lot of moving parts on my system. <laughs> yeah, because uh, um, we do a lot of compose, and I think a uh, lot of customers do too. I think that's probably the number one, the number one thing to add there. Um, yeah, there are literally millions of compose files out there. I know. I you know n nobody that I know of uses. I mean, developers use it primarily so that we can get all our dependencies up and running, so we can just work on the code. I, I don't know anybody that you know, wrongfully uses it in production or something like that. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. But um, from a developer experience perspective, it's just represents to me uh, a tremendous amount less YAML that I have to write versus trying to run a local Kubernetes experience. Um, you know, if I'm running Minikube or Kind or something like that, um, I just, I don't want to have to deal with all of the other stuff the cruft that comes along in addition to the development stuff that I have to do. Uh, and so Compose just makes it easier. Um, but I can still do all the networking and everything else. I think that's a common question usually with uh, people moving to Podman. So all the networking and storage and everything else should be like a drop in replacement pretty much for Do uh, you know from Docker to Podman. And that shows up inside um, of, my doc of my Podman desktop environment, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, talk talk a little bit about something that Docker doesn't do, like pods. So, when we view pods, how do we view pods differently than what we would say, you know, um, you know, working with uh, um, Docker? Um, from a, I mean, user experience standpoint within Podman Desktop. Uh, there's very little difference, and uh, you know you can start and stop both. Uh, it's what's running underneath that's uh, fundamentally different. Um, you know, when you run compose, it's really just something that's driving individual containers and you know networking settings uh, within the container engine. When you're running pods, you are running. You know, there's a maybe a few things you can't do that you can do in Kubernetes pods, but Podman will run, uh, you know, uh, regular pods uh, just fine, and it's standing it up the same way that you would in a Kubernetes environment. So, you know, again, at a UI level, there's very little different. You start a set of containers, you can see the logs, you can uh, manage it, um, but what's running underneath is is fundamentally different. Yeah, we've, um, had, uh, um, we've had a couple uh, comments about uh, Compose. Um, uh, I'm looking up the, the list here to see if there's any questions we're kind of missing. We talked a little bit about packaging. Um, there was a question about managing user namespaces within Podman Desktop. <coughs> Is that a, something? Yeah point we're not uh, doing anything with namespaces mm -hmm. I mean it's something we could in the future if there's a uh, demand for it I know there was something you and I had a conversation about this morning which is my favorite topic which is WebAssembly <laughs> so yeah uh, I was thinking maybe it's time to shift and uh, talk about where we're going um, yeah. and that's uh, that's definitely one of them um, we have a blog post that's coming out uh, very soon, um, just talking about how you can run WebAssembly on Podman. Um, you know, uh, wait a week or two, and uh, that'll be out there. Um, we're at the point where it's going from you need to do one manual step to things just work um, out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be a nice, nice change. 
Um, so I look forward to that uh, that blog and uh, yeah, continued support for for Wasm. So, so, um, so actually, just in case you don't mind, what are like some of the advantages of like why would somebody want to use Wasm instead of you know running containers? Oh, I know that. I know. I, I'm not. I, Rob, Rob has made sure that I know the answer to this. But <laughs> in case, in case uh, anybody who's attending is is unaware of why you might want to run uh, a web assembly instead of uh, a, a container, what, what, like what, what's the driver? What, what are we looking to 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 do with that? Well, I mean that's a uh, political discussion too, and I'm I'm curious, uh, Robert. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, you know, from my perspective, it's uh, there's just a whole bunch of advantages. So, um, besides WebAssembly being a sandboxed uh, environment that is secure um, on its own, I can also add to it container security. So, if I do say a scratch container with WebAssembly. Um, it's got not going to be a different size in addition to the security. I can also get it to be the same size as the executable that I would have uh, built anyway. So if I was doing something like in Rust or Java or C++, um, it would be the same size in a scratch container. In addition to that, um, it's you know, by its nature, um, I can run that on any architecture. So. For instance, right now I have um, WebAssembly running with Podman on my um, Mac, which is an ARM-based machine, and the Intel-based machine I have behind me that I run some tests on, I just pull down the container image and run it over here on Podman and it works. If I do a ahead of time compile, um, that's gonna be different because you're gonna target the architecture, but the, the point is, is from a developer perspective, I'm going to get better performance from the ahead of time compile, but I'm going to get that cross platform compatibility um, in addition to that. So security size and size does matter, especially because I, I work a lot with um, uh, folks doing edge. And so whenever I have to push something across the wire to something else, I want it to be as small as possible. The fact that I can target multiple architectures, um, there's just a bunch of those advantages and the fact that it runs in Podman and now I can see it in Podman desktop is a huge advantage to me from a developer perspective because I can start it and look at it and run it just like it's any other container now. If, if you want, I can do a dissertation on this for the following hour, but we really came here to talk to the Podman desktop team, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a favorite topic of mine. <laughs> I got one other question for you guys too. So um, I had mentioned uh, then this doesn't this isn't coming from the um, from online, but uh, so, so I mentioned like when I first opened Podman Desktop, I was like, okay, this is a really nice UI, like this is a really nice application. Um, could you guys talk a little bit about maybe the difference, or or is there a difference in developing UI and UX inside of open source projects, which often have a reputation of being you know really you know um, arcane and hard to use and command line driven? Um, is it different doing a UI in the open source uh, community? than it is for doing like proprietary stuff. Uh, I don't know if anyone else is going to answer. Yeah. I mean, for me, I've been doing open source developer tools for like 20 years now. Um, so I don't know uh, anything different. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's definitely, uh, you know, different uh, developing a, a UI tool um, compared to uh, command line or something that's, you know, uh, but mostly that comes out in, you know, the complexity of UI and the user experience and the, uh, you know, the questions that opens and how do you test and, you know, that set of things, but it's no different to doing it in the open versus doing it internally. I would say the one, the difference, and I, I have a keynote I've given a couple times about this, um, is when you're practicing design uh, in upstream open source communities, it's very different than if you're doing it for pr proprietary software. Um, designers don't normally have a background to deal with uh, a broad community, let's just say, that has very strong opinions. Um, uh, the the design sort of background you, you like go to critique sessions and you get pretty badly roasted so you don't want to present anything except what is going to pass that critique with your uh with your pride intact um so designers just generally as a practice tend to not show their work until it's almost complete and very polished 
that doesn't work in an open source development context. You have to show works in progress. You have to show back of the napkin sketches. You have to show dumb ideas because they're great food, brain food for better ideas. You have to be able to do that give and take. Um, so it takes a lot of um, a community management practice on top of your design to be able to be effective in that environment. So I think, I think to Tim's point, I think if you're a developer, it's not really different. But I think if you're the UX person on the team, it's a very different experience if you've never been in an open source context before. Um, my team at Red Hat is actually sort of a group of designers that are specifically upstream focused because it is such a, a very specific skill set. So yeah, I think that's a can you like can software. you elaborate on you know it, it's a it's an electron based app right so um, just give us an example of, you know how some of the decisioning made there because most of the folks that we work with they use open source but they don't know how imp, you know people uh, create the input from the community and other things like that so um, you know maybe if you want to talk about that a little. Like, how do you take input from the community? How do you get that feedback? Well, I don't yeah, know. Uh, Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we are uh, an Electron app, just like Slack and uh, you know several other, other tools um, for our, uh, our web uh, componentization. It's uh, Svelte. Um, and we're lucky to have a, uh, a lead uh, you know, architect on the team that picked some of those choices early on just based on where he saw the, you know, the community, uh, not just ours, but like generally uh, going. Uh, it's a very nice technical base to develop on. I, you know, at the start of the year, I had never uh, used it before, you know, initial learning like anything else, but it's actually, you can see why. It's a good base for building uh, tools like this. Um, and like anything else, uh, you know, you're doing open source. And I think as developers, we're kind of used to it, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, you put up a PR, other people will be vocal if they think it's, uh, you know, the quality is too low or it's a bad thing to do. And we get a little bit of a, a tough skin and, uh, you know, you learn to work within uh, a community. Nobody has veto power. Uh, you know, something annoys you, you propose a fix for it. Maybe somebody has a better idea and, you know, you keep, uh, you keep working like that. I think as Mo said, it's probably more difficult for uh, the UX, for documentation, for people who are used to uh, either working internally or, you know, being the only person uh, who has a say on a particular thing because <laughs> we're very vocal, we all have opinions. Yeah, and I, I would also say that um, for for in terms of like to, to get the information that we use to make decisions, because honestly, like software development is basically making a thousand decisions every day that impact thousands of people, depending on how many people use your software. And um, you really need good data on what the users are trying to do in order to make the best default decision, in order to decide what should be on the screen, what shouldn't we do, what will deliver the best experience. It's it's very complex and nuanced. What we have been doing on the Palm and Desktop team, we're on our second round. We just do open public user interviews. So we'll do like a call for participation. We have an early adopters program that um, you'll see some information if you go to the, the website that was already posted, there's information on our Podman desktop um, early adopters program. So we have a mailing list for them. If you, you join, you can sign up. We'll invite you to participate in these studies. It sounds like, oh, it's a study. Oh my gosh. No, it's like you get on a call with me and one of my compatriots on the UX team and we just ask you questions about, you know, what, what are your pain points working with containers? What are your pain points working with Kubernetes? How can we help make that easier for you? And we just kind of talk through what they're actually trying to do. Um, and then we feed that information back to the development team and we discuss it and we decide, you know, hey, we're doing this new feature for Kubernetes support. Um, you know, these are the things you just they wanted and we'll go based on the data they gave us to make all of those thousands of decisions cool so um all right i think we're coming up on time um anything you guys want to talk about uh before we break off here yeah uh, maybe two things just 
one, you know, if you're willing to do a, a user study, uh, please reach out. You know, we're always looking for feedback. Um, but we're also, uh, I mean, grateful for the number of people who have just gotten involved in the project, either fixing the one bug that was annoying them or opening up issues. Um, you know, sometimes one person's hitting something and, you know, uh, you don't know whether it's pervasive or if it's uh, other people are seeing it. The great thing about an open source project is a really low bar to just let us know what's going on, how you think we could improve, drop a comment, fix a bug, whatever. Uh, we always appreciate that. Um, the other is uh, we started sort of talking about where we're going. We talked about WASM. Um, the other uh, uh, things that are in development right now, I mean, one is the Kubernetes context, being able to see the different uh, uh, configs, uh, what your current context is, cleaning that up, uh, you know, seeing information about all the, the contexts. Um, I also deployed that pod to Kubernetes, uh, to, to the sandbox, um, but we don't have any representation for the other things that we had to uh, you know, push in that YAML. So ingress routes, services, deployments, we want to have those represented in Podman Desktop as well, just like pods. Um, so you'll be able to flip to those, you know, interact with them, delete them. Um, and we're always looking for feedback. You know, what what's your use case? What do you do on a daily basis? How can we help you? So based on the uh, feedback from the community, what do you guys see as, or what do you folks see as the um, the top requests, I guess, would be? Because I'm, I'm just a happy user. So um, I, <laughs> I started using it when he first put it out, and it just gets better for me. So I just... I completely switched away from uh, Docker desktop um, completely. So I, I, uh, I'm just happy every time you guys put something out. But um, from a, you know, I'm not asking what you guys are going to do next. I'm asking kind of more or less uh, from a community request perspective. What do you guys see as the top requests? I mean, honestly, uh, to me. Uh... Yeah, you know, we're deploying this to three different platforms, multiple different operating systems with, you know, who knows, random other software installed. Uh, and you don't make that work seamlessly on day one. It takes months to catch the edge cases, catch the what can go wrong and improve it. Um, so I'm really thankful that the community is giving us time to uh, to get through that. But that's still, you know, kind of an ongoing uh you know we hear oh in this networking setup there's an issue and it takes time to work through that and uh, and fix that um the onboarding that uh mo showed you know when you install on day one we help you install podman we help you install compose um you know we want to make that as seamless as possible so you get to the point where you can just run things and it works um so to me we're still kind of going through that cleaning up the ui making things pretty um, you know, while we start adding the, the next set of features for Kubernetes and, and other things. I would say a common request every time we have a new release, somebody mentions light mode. We were just talking about that this morning. So it, it is on our roadmap. If you want to help and you're good with Svelte and Tailwind, please reach out. <laughs> We'd love your help. So um, uh, Maureen, what is, uh, what is Quadlet? Quadlet is sort of a, you know, honestly, probably I can't go into technical depth too much on this. You might be probably know more than I do, but it's the way that I see it is a way to um, run sort of groups of pods without going full blown Kubernetes. Um, I believe it's system based. Um, so, and it's something that is common. Oh, sorry. You're, you're breaking up a little bit. So, yeah. All right, I'll, skip uh, me. I'll jump. In. I asked you the question, and I'm, I, uh, I'll answer a little bit of it. So um, Quadlet just got added, uh, I think, GA and Podman. And um, prior to that, if I wanted to run something usually at the edge, I would combine it with System D because I wasn't running Kubernetes. So I'd run uh, System D with Podman to make sure that it was up and running. And if something failed, and it, uh, System D would make it restart, et cetera. But what if I want to run? a group of containers and Podman, uh, 
you know, typically uh, at the edge, but I don't want to put Kubernetes down there because of, I don't need Kubernetes for uh, one because uh, um, I'm not trying to scale it. I'm not trying to do anything except deploy it and then keep it up and running. But I have a group of um, containers. So um, Quadlet uh, allows me to do that with uh, System D, where I can now say, take this group of containers, make sure they're up and running um, and, and do that. So um, if you somebody does a Google search for Podman plus Quadlet, um, they'll get uh, a bunch of information that we just GA'd about that. Dark mode. Somebody just wrote dark mode FTW. So um, <laughs> <laughs> Maureen just smiled that that smile like <laughs> I don't know what all that means, but <laughs> that I mean, that's why we started with dark mode, you know. You're going from like a terminal or you're going from, you know, an IDE and they're all dark. When you go to Podman desktop, it shouldn't shock you. So our first priority was dark, but we're definitely looking at light too. Sorry. So you guys are all user experience people and I'm just going to, um, we're not going to, I mean, I'm going to fill some ad, extra space here, but like I'm colorblind. What do you guys do for, um, you know, folks that, are challenged when it comes to looking at the monitor all day. If if you didn't know I was colorblind, everything's blue to me. So everything in the house, right? So <laughs> what uh what do you guys do for um you know when you guys are designing, how do you take uh you know and I must imagine that must even be difficult for open source when you're taking into account usability where most people are are looking at feature functionality and your guys are also looking at how usable it is. So any comments on that? Well, Tim, you could probably talk through the, the the container icon discussion we had this morning with the outlines and the and the symbols. <laughs> yeah, I, I think between Podman and Kubernetes, uh, there are something like nine, what did they really say, nine or ten different states that a container can be in, and each one of them, you know, needs a color or something as a representation. Right. Um, so we're trying to make that consistent everywhere in the UI. So when you, uh, you know, you see a, a state in one place, you recognize it elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, making sure that all are uh, accessible, uh, you know, work for people who are colorblind, it, it's always a challenge. Uh, and like anything, if you see a place where we've messed up something like that or it's not uh clear the differentiation uh we'll fix it in bugs and the, yeah, the approach I, I we've like, taken go ahead sorry. sorry i have mic problems um the approach we've taken basically is you don't rely on color it's just a bonus but you have to have the shape or the symbol first as the prime so this morning we were discussing a fill versus an empty outline to show on versus off rather than just green and red. Great. Cause uh, I, I, uh, I'm a JetBrains user uh, from an IDE perspective normally. And uh, um, Visual Studio Code has some hieroglyphics in there that um, if you're colorblind, you can't read because the icon shows up, but you can't actually see the hieroglyphic in it. Right. So um, that's been a bugbear for me. Um, and it's not a problem on Podman desktop. So I was just wondering how you guys achieved that because it must be a lot of, like you said this morning, there was a meeting. There must be a lot of conversation around that because it, I can see everything on it. So um, anyway, that was just my little tidbit of useless information there. So I'm now at that age where legally uh, um, I'm ob obligated to impart useless information on everyone I meet. So um, having said that, um, Anything, Jeremy, you want to, you got any other comments? Um, yeah, no, I think we're, we're, at the top, we're at the top of the hour. I think, so thanks very much for joining us today. And hopefully you guys, obviously it sounds like a lot of people who are tuned in today are, are, are already using Podman, um, but we, it looks like we have some new people too, because there are a number of questions about getting start, set up. So we can put once yeah, again, so, let's, um, let's throw the URL in the chat again. We got the URL chat. So how do you involve the project and how to get your hands on it? Great, and thank you very much for uh, everyone joining today. Uh, Maureen, uh, Tim, Jeff, I really appreciate it. And uh, 
hopefully we can get uh, more people interested in this and involved in uh, feedback for you. All right. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank everyone you. Have a great day. Thank you very much for joining us today, everyone. And uh, uh, the recording will be out there so that you can give this to friends and family. Thank you. Bye. These are coming up. <laughs>